G'day Crypto Goers, investors and fellow economists. I'm Adam Stokes, welcome back onto the channel where we have some very interesting news about the RBA cutting its interest rate down by 25 points to an all-time low of 0.5%. Many are saying that this is because of a certain virus that is out there. I won't be saying the virus by name because every time I do, the YouTube algorithm gets upset for whatever reason, demonetizes and de-ranks videos talking about this worldwide uh, perhaps epidemic, certainly not a pandemic yet, but epidemic that is spreading. Uh, there is talks for both sides of the argument with respect to the CV, the CV being the virus that is out there at the moment and is causing economic chaos. We saw it happening in China and then spreading over into other economies. And now the argument is that it's creeping down to the Australian economy. This cut of 25 points, some believe is only because of the CV. Some people say it has nothing to do with the CV. Uh, for me, I say it is a combination of both. But let's read this article from the good people at news.com. It says, the RBA has cut the cash rate to a new record low of 0.5% as it moves to buttress the economy against a worse than expected hit from the CV. Pricing for the 25 basis point rate cut has advanced from an outside chance last week to a foregone conclusion by Tuesday morning following a torrid weekend for a virus-rattled economy. In his address following the March board meeting, RBA Governor Philip Lowe said earlier forecasts that the economy had reached a gentle turning point were now under a cloud. GDP growth in the March quarter is likely to be noticeably weaker than earlier expected. Prior to the outbreak, there were signs that the slowdown in the global economy that started in 2018 was coming to an end, Dr. Lowe said in his address after the bank's March board meeting. It's too early to tell how persistent the effects of the CV will be and at what point the global economy will return to an improving path. Dr. Lowe said the virus is expected to delay progress towards the RBA's target for full employment and inflation. He said the RBA board remains prepared to ease monetary policy further. The market is predicting the next move to 0.25% by June, at which point policymakers would launch quantitative easing measures. Now, how convenient that when this virus is coming out, that the RBA governor, who is, in my opinion, questionable at the best of times, highly skilled operator, very um, articulate and intelligent, of course, to hold that position, but noting what's happening in the global economy, noting what's happening with fiat systems and banks, isn't it convenient that as this virus spreads, all point or interest rate cuts are a result of the virus itself and nothing to do with anything else that is going out there. This is, in my opinion, absolute nonsense. Now that's not to say, as I said at the beginning of this video, that the CV doesn't have anything to do with what's happening in the global economy. It most certainly does. When we can see economies, are their borders shut down, uh, whether they be on a micro or macro scale, people lose money. They lose money in the simplest terms when someone doesn't have a job to go to, and in the biggest terms when trades bet trade between countries is uh, ground to a halt with uh, goods and services not being able to move through, and that could be something as... Uh, simple as stock being moved from one country to another or something a little bit more complex about the tourism industry where people are no longer allowed to travel because of the risk involved. There has uh, been a release from the, I think it's a DFAT Travelers website, which is the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in Australia, where they release travel warnings to the good people of Australia and there are more people, uh, more countries being put on this list that are too dangerous to travel to. And certainly where I am at the moment, there have been steps taken by the government in this particular country where I am that have banned people coming into their country from other countries. So there have been flights banned coming from China to this country and to other countries where the, uh, the government at the time in this certain country has just said, no, we're not risking it, no flights in from that country. And that, of course, has a huge economic impact, if anything, just on the tourism industry, which for many countries is the foundation of much of the money they make, if not all the money they make within their uh, economies. So to close off this article, I'll leave a link to it uh, as I edit this video later on my desktop, uh, which is actually a broken laptop where I am at the moment. 
a uh, bit of trivia for you. I've got a laptop that I got over, I brought to this country with me. It works, but the screen doesn't work. So I've got to plug the laptop by digital cable into my television and the television's got a crappy picture. So the resolution is terrible. So technology is not my friend at this, uh, at this place I am at the moment, but nonetheless, the show goes on. Reading more from this article, it says, once the CV is contained, the Australian economy is expected to return to an improving trend, Dr. Lowe said. Westpac was the first of the big banks out, out the door on Tuesday to announce it would pass on the full 25% reduction in variable interest rates for home loans, as well as small business cash-based loans and overdrafts. Commonwealth Bank and NAB followed suit after. Prime Minister Scott Morrison had earlier said he expected the margin pressured banks to do the right thing by consumers and pass on any interest cut rate in full. Australia's interest rate has already been lowered three times to 0.75% last year in a bid to kickstart an economy that was sluggish even before summer's bushfires and CV threat came into play. Retail stores, as well as construction and business investment, have fallen. Confidence remains soft, poor wage, wages growth has continued, and unemployment and underemployment has risen since the last RBA board meeting in February. Just a quick point on unemployment. Remember, in economic terms, you don't actually want to achieve 100% unemployment. There is a natural rate of unemployment, and that natural rate, just to correct what I said before, you don't want to have 100% of employment and 0% of unemployment because economic, in economic terms, you have a natural rate of unemployment. And that natural rate in a, a strong economy is, is about 5%. And that natural rate involves people moving between careers, uh, graduating from school and looking for jobs, uh, possibly taking uh, leave, as in not leave from a certain job, but leaving the workforce for a given period. That might be to have a family or do other things. But when you have 100% employment, the problem with that is it affects the wages. So economies do in fact want a natural rate of employment, which is around 5%. But reading on, it says retail, retail sales, sorry, just lost my spot as this little screen also plays up on me. Come on technology, stay with me. Retail sales as well as construction and business investment have fallen. Confidence remains soft, poor, poor, poor wages growth has continued and unemployment and underemployment has risen since the RBA board meeting in February. I've just read that paragraph twice for you, uh, partly because of my mistake, partly because it's really important. Let's go with the latter. December quarter GDP data on Wednesday is expected to show Australia's economy extended, expanded by a soft 0.3%, taking annual growth to a below trend 1.9%. Indeed, indeed, APAC economist Callum Pickering said further stimulus would be necessary to help the economy meet its unemployment and inflation goals within the next two years. The Reserve Bank no doubt recognises that cutting today won't help an economy a great deal, at least not in the short term, Mr Pickering said. But the economic circumstances, both short and medium term, warrant greater support. Even without CV, the Australian economy was not travelling as well as it should be. AMP Shane Oliver said given the size of the threat to the growth, once rate cuts are exhausted at 0.25%, the RBA is likely to turn to quantitative easing during the second half. So what we see now is we are heading towards 0% interest rates. If you've been on my channel for some time and been following me, I have been saying for at least six months, possibly a year, I'd have to look back on my records, but certainly I've been saying for at least six months that Australia is already at negative interest rates. And this certainly proves in my mind mathematically that we are at negative interest rates. Now you might argue, well, hang on, we're at 0.25% or 0.5%, 0.5% at the moment heading towards 0.25%, well, inflation is 2%. The amount of money that is going into the economy with quantitative easing, with no saving interest for anyone who puts anything into term deposits, nothing worth mentioning anyway. We've got cash bans, we've got bail-in laws, we now have interest rates cutting to almost 0%, in real num numbers, we are at negative interest rates. We are heading for an economic crash.
I have released a video just recently about this. These are more signs as big players scramble to find any excuse for fiat currency. We can blame it on unemployment, we can blame it on other countries, we can blame it on a sniffle flu, or we can blame it on the reality of what's happening around us. Fiat currency. Fiat currency cannot work, will not work, and we are finally starting to see the truth in the markets. The markets never lie, and this is a consequence of the truth of the markets, that being that fiat systems don't work, fractional reserve lending is complete market failure, and centralized bodies who control money, well, attempt to control money through never ending printing and so called quantitative easing are hurting all of us. This is the beginning of the end, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I actually mean it in a positive way. I think there is an opportunity for us all to make a lot of money if we are wise and we stay up to date with what's happening around us to break away from these systems and look for new ways of doing business. So, I'm going to close off with a quick article that. I found that is in fact dated the 28th of February, and this was um, released uh, a few days ago, but it was quite interesting. It was written by a lass called Nicola Field, and it talked about the spread of the CV and how it rattled the international community here in Australia, and you don't have to catch the bud bug to feel the impact. The article reads, the CV has dominated news headlines since early 2020. Thanks to Thankfully, the number of confirmed cases in Australia is low, standing at 23 as of late February. But it's a far cry from the situation in China, where more than 80,000 cases have been recorded and a number of other countries are reporting new cases of infection. First and foremost, CV is a human crisis. It makes now the time for heightened hygiene and taking every precaution to safeguard yourself and your family. The latest advice from experts is that frequent hand washing is one of the best forms of defence. The Australian government health authorities say surgical masks are only helpful in preventing people who already have the virus from spreading it to others. <clears throat> even, even so, if you experience flu-like symptoms such as fever, coughing, sore throat and fatigue or shortness of breath, contact your doctor. How ironic that, as I say, I need to clear my throat. There are many questionable things about the country I live in at the moment, but the good thing about where I live is that it's very strict with infection control, very strict with who comes into the country, and the place where I am is one of the, I would argue, one of the cleanest places to be, so um, hopefully I'm okay. Just on a side note, we're talking about uh, the CV with a few people tonight, and they were saying that um, many medical doctors have spoken about the CV being less harmful than the common flu, uh, I won't go into the details about that because uh, this isn't a medical channel. This is a financial, economic and crypto channel. And we explore ways of looking at the economy, looking at financial systems, looking at crypto and other types of money, as well as looking at ways of building a future financially through health, wealth, love and happiness. Uh, the pinch will be felt worldwide. In today's interconnected global economy, you don't have to contract CV to experience the fallout. China is a major economic powerhouse with close ties to Australia and chances are many of us will indirectly experience some impact from the disease. Here are seven ways Australians may be affected by CV. Now note the date of this. This was on the 28th of February and today is the first, correction, the 3rd of March. Number one, interest rates could fall. As the world's second largest economy after the US, China is leading a trading notion and the economic fallout from Corona, I nearly said it, threatens the global economy. Much of China's economy has been in lockdown for several weeks to prevent the spread of the disease. And according to the World Economic Forum that is expected to slice 4.5% off China's first quarter economic output, any slowdown in China's economy will be felt here in Australia. China is our number one trading partner, accounting for one quarter of our international trade according to the Trade and Investment at a Glance 2019 report. Chinese, China buys around 25% of our coal exports and is our leading source of tourists. The RBA has made it clear that it's prepared to cut the official cash rate to prevent the economy flattering. If the fallout from the CV means our economy hits a speed bump, we could see interest rates drop to new lows. Uh, good prediction there, um, Nicola Field. Uh, 
five days ago you made this prediction and you probably wrote the article a, f a few days before it was released. Uh, in, in economic terms, uh, to be fair, this is, was quite predictable. Um, you don't really have to be an economic expert to see that when these type of things happen in the world, the way to prop up an economy, to stimulate economy, is to put more money in the economy. And one of the ways of putting more money into the economy is by stimulating spending. And one of the ways of stimulating spending is reducing interest rates. And when you reduce interest rates, in theory, in eco pure economic theory, people are likely, maybe in theory, to borrow more. And when they borrow more, they spend that money. And when they spend that money, it starts the economy moving. In my last um, video I released, I spoke about how all economies are affected by the US economy. The same rings true for now the Chinese economy. And that is because many of the investments in and out of China uh, centralize around the global community. And this global community is either buying uh, goods, and, goods and services from China or selling raw materials to China. I remember when I was doing my economics degree many years ago, we used to um, have a laugh about China buying all of Australia's sugar, not all of it, but we sold a lot of sugar to China and then we bought it off China at six times the cost uh, in sugar packets. Now, it might seem a bit crazy to do that, but in a global community, if China can refine and package sugar cheaper than Australia can, and making sure that the cost of moving that sugar across um, seas and oceans and land to get it to China so they can refine it and package it for us, uh, as crazy as it seems to move sugar to the other side of the planet and then buy it back at six times the expense, if it's cheaper than us doing it ourselves, that is how a global village works. That's how global economies work by moving goods and service around. Another example is we sell our steel to Japan. Japan turns it into a Toyota or a Honda and we buy that back. And there's nothing wrong with that in the, in the economic space of doing what is uh, best for your country and for other countries. We are best in Australia at digging resources out of the ground and growing uh, crops and farming beef and other types of meats. Uh, it's very difficult for certain countries to do that because A, they don't have the resources in the ground or the space to do it. But when we work in synergy, you do what you do best. That is, if Japan builds cars better than us and we build uh, source meat from our farms, uh, wheat from our crops and steel from our ground or iron ore from our ground and we can do an exchange of these goods and services and we get the best outcome for each economy, that is the way to move forward. But of course, if anything affects that, where economies are closed down and people don't want to continue this relationship, everyone kind of hurts. In the example of selling sugar to China, uh, China doesn't get this huge amount of business from us anymore where we're putting sugar into the Chinese market. All their factories shut down that used to package it for us. And of course, at our end, we no longer get cheap packaged sugar. We now have to uh, package our own sugar which costs far more for us because we have a higher labor rate and a higher tax rate so it becomes very inefficient even though it's um, probably better for the environment not selling those or moving those huge shipping containers across the planet full with sugar at one end and back with sugar at the other end it's um i've also spoken about as i digress a little bit more before we get on to number two there is a battle between the environment and and economics when you talk about growths of economy, the, the, the reality of it, the core reality of growing an economy or stimulating an economy is it comes at a cost of the environment. Now, many would argue this isn't the case, but in reality, it is the case. It is the case because whenever you're selling, making, moving, processing stuff, it has an impact on the environment. So a constant push for economic growth economic growth, economic growth comes at a cost to the environment. And you'll actually see an article or a video or an advert series released by Dick Smith some time ago where he tried to actually make this point. And he made it very well. He articulated the point with very good visuals, but it was shut down very quickly because many, not all, but many governments don't want to admit that. And certainly many businesses don't want to admit that because if they have to admit there's an impact on the environment when companies and uh, countries are making big money from economic growth, uh, they could in fact receive global and political and social pressure and 
pushback from it. So it's this balancing act of trying to have a strong economy without compromising the environment. And I can prove this as an extreme example. When China's economy went through the roof, their environmental health went through the floor. Rivers, air, sea, land was destroyed. Not all of it, a huge chunk of it. And it was destroyed as their economy was soaring through the roof. And that is a very good example of economies going very well whilst their environment is um, plummeting through the floor. Alternatively, if you look at very poor economies, uh, I won't say a certain nation, but it may be in the continent of Africa. You can see if there isn't much economic stimulus or growth in those countries, sometimes the environment can be pretty stable because nothing is really happening. Nigeria is not an example of that. Nigeria is not an example of that because they've got huge amounts of economic potential, but their environment is destroyed because of oil fields that have been not mismanaged and there's oil everywhere, it's destroyed the environment, and they're poor, and there's a lot of corruption. So as long as humans do the right thing and manage things well, we can move these things forward. If it doesn't work well, uh, both the economy and the environment can suffer significantly. But getting back to point number two, it says, so this is an effect, point number one of uh, what could happen with the CV hitting the world. Number one was interest rates could fall, and number two is your super may take a hit Listen up, Australia. Given China's strength in the world's economy, it's no surprise that share markets have become spooked by the CV, especially as it spreads further afield. Late February saw media reports of 51 billion wiped off the Aussie share market. How it pays to put things in perspective. However, it pays to put things in perspective. The Australian Securities Exchange (ASX) is worth a total of two trillion dollars, and the recent falls amount to a drop of 2.15%. Moreover, the 12-month market gains still add up to 11% as of 26 February. Nonetheless, it's likely a good chunk of your super is invested in local and international shares. So your nest egg is likely to feel the pinch in the short term at least. On the flip side, now could be a good time to stock up on quality shares while prices are down. Great point here. Remember, you want to invest when there's blood on the streets and on the markets. When everyone is scared, you should be buying. And when everyone's confident, you should be selling. Not financial advice. It's just the fundamentals of our trading and many trading books and our gurus will tell you the same thing. Buy when it's low, sell when it's high. That part's not rocket science. The real science of it, or the art, I should say, is is the psychology of it. When people are scared, that's a time for you to be brave. And when people are confident, that's actually a time for you to be scared. And at the moment when everyone is scared, it may be an opportunity for you to get some good stocks. Now, I'm not telling you which stocks to buy or if you should buy stocks or uh, precious metals or um, cryptocurrencies. I am saying that you need to be investing in yourself and becoming wiser with everything that's happening out there, noting that we are facing economic downturn, we are seeing interest rates plummet towards zero, and as I argue, already in the negative interest rates, and we are seeing multiple markets being affected by what's happening in the world, not just because of the CV, but because of everything that's happening in the financial space, that is fiat. Point number three, that new iPhone could be harder to buy. If you're in the market for a new Apple product, you could be disappointed. Apple has announced that, it would, that its worldwide supply of iPhones will be constrained in the immediate future. Here's a quick example of where you, people can make money. As iPhone collapses or pulls back, iPhones the, uh, made by Apple aren't released as much. Well, do you think Samsung's cutting back? Now, of course, in Korea, the, in South Korea, there has been many cases of CV there, but there's no talk about Samsung pulling back or uh, Huawei pulling back or other phones pulling back but iPhone that has most of its if not all of its production done in China where there is those borders put up that being the economic borders and barriers put up as China is no longer trading and or countries are choosing not to tra trade with China because of the CV we can see in this in instance the iPhone will be constrained it turns out that the iPhone manufacturer partner sites which are located outside the Hubei province, the epicenter of the CV, have all reopened following an earlier lockdown. However, these facilities are ramping up more slowly than Apple had anticipated. 
sorry it's quite late where I am here at the moment but I wanted to pump out this video because this information is important uh, to me to you to the world economy and to many businesses out there who contribute to these world economies and for us as the battlers who will be affected by everything that is happening in the economic space. Point number four, car parts may become harder to source. There's never a good time to have a bingle in your car, but right now could prove especially ill time depending on the make of your car that you drive. A number of global car makers, including Nissan and Hyundai, which is contrary to what I've been talking about, just bear with um, Samsung, Hyundai being in Korea, of course, but they have temporarily closed factories outside China because they can't get parts. That's likely to impact local suppliers, so check with your mechanic if you're planning to get your car repaired or serviced. Fascinating, so, but makes perfect sense. We are a global community, and car parts pretty much don't come from Australia. There might be a few very small suppliers, but essentially the car manufacturing industry in Australia died, uh, had the last nail in the coffin a few years ago when the Holden factory in Elizabeth, South Australia closed down, but we haven't really been a car producer in Australia properly for, for decades. Uh, we did have a Nissan factory, a Ford factory, a Toyota factory, but each of these factories have closed down one by one as I went, as we moved to that example of countries do what they can do best. And because labor is so expensive in Australia and production is very labor intensive, it's cheaper in the global economy to move those things offshore. But now that in the global economy, these things that are moved offshore have the constraints on them, it's coming back to, to hurt us. Remember, the opposite to an open economy is called an autarky. And an autarky, there's no true autarky in the world, but an autarky is or an autarkistic economy is where everything is closed. You do everything yourself. Um, North Korea may be an example of that, but it's not really even a true autarky because North Korea has immense amounts of trade coming from China. So there are, in fact, huge <clears throat> stocks and shipping lanes coming through China and even through South Korea to an extent. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes. Sometimes the train lines into Korea are open, between North and South that is, and sometimes they're closed, but in any case they can occur. But even if you think of certain tribes and certain nations where they might be on the surface completely autarkistic, they still may trade with other tribes where they might be exchanging, um, I don't know, animal skins and meats and even labor and dare I say people but uh, moving on to point number five China made products may be in short supply China is a leading manufacturer and its extended shutdown may leave some items in short supply federal treasurer Josh Frydenberg for instance noted that people in the building industry have expressed concern about their ability to get products in the event that Chinese factories remain closed with so many of our everyday purchases imported from China, it is likely we could see shortages. This may be an opportunity if you're a producer to start releasing your product, but noting if the CV dies down and global borders and trade routes open up again, you'll be facing that tough competition of people producing goods and services cheaper than you. However, not everyone's competing on price. I certainly don't always compete on price, I always uh, like to shop around for the best value for money and value for money does not mean the cheapest price, it means the best value, the best bang for your buck. And that certainly goes for uh, core items I normally purchase in my life. Uh, the big things I never go cheap on in my life is, well, well I don't go cheap on much now, but shoes, I, I never take a shortcut on because my whole body is on my feet and I need good support for my feet. I'm, I'm tall, I try to remain fit, I don't want to go cheap on my shoes, just as I don't go cheap on my tyres for my car, because that's what's a contact between me and my uh, my vehicle and the road. I don't go cheap on watches, but I only really buy a couple of good watches, really expensive watches, and I never have to replace them or repair them, and I never go cheap on sunglasses. Uh, I have always worn Oakleys, I don't work for Oakley, they're not the cheapest sunglasses, certainly not the most expensive, but it's just something I never go cheap on. And when you're buying certain things in your life, you will actually find that you don't always want to go cheap uh, because then you're constantly replacing it or it's constantly needing repair or it's constantly uh, becoming out of date before you can really make use of it. Uh, technology might be an example of that. If you get the cheapest computer out there, depending on what you want to do with it, 
all the software and hardware may be out of, doubt before, out of date before you know it, so you've already got to upgrade it. But I digress again, which is nothing I ever do on this channel. Number six, your cha uh, travel plans could be derailed. International travelers, beware. This is one area where the situation is developing on an almost daily basis. As it stands in late February, the continued spread of the CV has seen the DFAT, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, issue travel warnings for places Australians have previously visited without concern. China comes with a DFAT warning of do not travel. Even Hong Kong and Japan, both popular destinations for Aussies and highly developed economies, come with a DFAT warning, exercise a high degree of caution. If you've already booked trips into these countries, check the fine print of your travel insurance. Heading off to risky destinations could invalidate your cover. This is especially the case if you know the risks and DFAT has issued a warning, but you decide to go anyway. Regardless of any DFAT warning, some travel policies feature general exclusions for contagi contagious diseases and pandemics. Bottom line, contact your travel insurance provider to see where you stand. My two cents on this, don't travel. That is, if you've got to go about your life, you go about your life. But if you've been planning for that once in a lifetime holiday and you've got the whole family going and you're about to make a considerable financial investment in booking those tickets, you can still go on your holiday, but just wait for a minute, wait for things to settle down. I remember once buying a ticket that I thought had full insurance on it and then I couldn't take the flight and I went to exercise that insurance and there was some fine print where they said, no, we're not paying for it. And what they did was actually immediately without even me asking, they just refunded what the premium that I paid. So I think I paid $100 insurance for this, I think it was about $2,000 ticket. So that was relatively quite an expensive price. And this was years ago before I was using platinum credit cards that had full coverage of insurance of travel. Um, but they just straight out said, no, this isn't covered, and they gave me my money back. So even when you think that you've got insurance on your travel, there's very good points raised here. Read the fine print. And even if you have read the fine print, insurance companies, it's not in their best interest to pay out all uh, claims. I've, I remember uh, doing research on insurance companies it's quite a standard practice to say no to every single claim that they get. Now, they might consider it when you appeal it, but if you imagine they have 100 claims in and they said no to 100 claims that came in, but only 50 people appealed that no, well, then straight away they've saved 50 claims and they haven't lost anything off the skin of their nose for saying no to those other claims. So there is a theory out there that it's in the insurance company's best interest to say no to all, if not most claims, and then only if a percentage, even if it's a high percentage, appeal it and successfully appeal it. Those who accept no the first time, they don't have to pay the claim for. Now, you might be a good um, debater or legal operator when it comes to reading the fine print, but at the end of the day, if you've made all these sacrifices in your life, including taking time off work, getting the kids out of school, uh, getting in the mindset that you're gonna travel, and then the week before you go to travel, you can't travel or you do travel and you catch this CV, whether it be not as bad as we hear or worse than what we hear, it's not worth it. Focus at the moment on uh, staying at home, travel to live your life as, as I say. If you've got to get out there and do your thing, well, do your thing. But if you're planning your life holiday, this once in a lifetime opportunity holiday to go somewhere, maybe now's not the time to do it. Maybe now is the time to focus on other things and take that holiday later when things settle down. Now, the flip side for this is if you don't believe in the CV, now could in fact be the good time to get some really cheap holidays because um, travel providers will be doing their best to stay out in, in business. And the only way they can do that with everyone pulling out of travel is to offer really good deals. And you're taking a huge risk to take those deals, particularly if countries close down their borders with or without travel agents moving forward or travel companies saying, yes, you can travel. If a country says you're not coming in or you're not getting out, it doesn't matter what insurance you've got or what um, uh, plane ticket you've got. If the government says you're not leaving, then you're stuck in the country. And if you're stuck in the country at the other end, well, how's that going to affect your employment? And how, that's, how is that going to affect your, uh, your savings when you have to now pay for a hotel to be in another country? 
And you might say, well, if the insurance covers it, that's great. Insurance doesn't cover indefinite stays. And most certainly insurances don't cover pandemics in many cases because um, it would put the insurance company out of business. But let's move on to the number seven, which is the last one. Petrol prices may fall. Finally, some good news. China is the world's biggest oil importer, but the combination of a hit on China's manufacturing and a slowdown in global travel has seen the first drop in global oil demand in a decade. That's impacting pump prices here in Australia. According to the Australian Institute of Petroleum, the national average price of unleaded petrol fell by 0.6 cents to a five-month low of $1.39.70 per litre in the first week of February. The longer the crisis continues, the better the value we could enjoy at the Bowser. So that is, on the surface, some good news. As I was talking about uh, towards the beginning of this video, again, more proof about the, the balance between economies and environments. Now we can see as China's economy is slowing down and China is the biggest oil importer in the world, those sales have dropped or those purchases from China of oil have dropped. And it's now economics 101. If the demand for oil has dropped, but the supply remains constant or goes up, then price goes down. And that is why petrol prices may fall. Now they may not fall because just because uh, petrol prices are, remain consistent doesn't mean that you're not gonna buy petrol. And this is where um, OPEC has oil producing, exporting countries have a ogolopoly over the uh, price of fuel globally because even if the demand drops they don't necessarily have to drop their prices because one way or another people who need oil need oil that is if you need petrol for your car it doesn't really matter what's happening in china you need petrol for your car but if we have a freer market in the production and exporting of oil which we can now actually see uh, through america entering the market that is now oil, america is exporting more oil than they are importing uh, which is a first for many, many decades, they now are competing against other oil producing exporting countries that are not necessarily part of the OPEC uh, ogolopoly, and they are competing against people uh, or countries or nations who have had this stronghold on the oil price now that there's a lesser demand for it and there's more supply of it and more suppliers of it, the price, as we see here, could in fact drop. But what should you do? So out of all of this, what should you do? Well, according to this article, remember the most important steps you can take to, are to maintain good hygiene to protect your health. While no one says exactly how things will pan out, the spread of the disease in China appears to be slowing. Some commentators are also suggesting that the warmer weather of the Northern Hemisphere spring will help stop the virus in its tracks. Chief economist of AMP Capital Investors, Shane Oliver, is forecasting that the virus will reach a containment stage and that Chinese global and Australian growth will rebound in 2020 and the June quarter of 2020 through the notes the risk of delay is significant though he notes the risk of delay is significant I just thought it was funny that I read this a chief economist is making a forecast on the virus um, economists don't really forecast medical issues that's up to the the WHO, the World Health Organization, although now that we raise it, the World Health Organization has some red flags on it as well because it appears that organization could, in fact, allegedly be suffering from uh, extreme cases of corruption, and those cor that corruption can, in fact, greatly distort and um, affect the messages that are coming out of an organization that, in fact, should be completely neutral and transparent. Right now, we're in uncharted waters and the message is clear. Be mindful of your health, think carefully about travel plans and avoid panic selling your investments. The CV genie may be out of the bottle, but with, the com with a common sense approach, it doesn't have to ruin your financial health. Uh, thank you for that article, Nicola. I found it quite interesting. Um, there's some really good points in there, some good discussion points. Uh, but remember, as I said at the beginning of this video and certainly at, uh, during my last videos and uh, throughout the last few months, even years of what I've been doing here in the YouTube space, uh, the economy is hurting, money is hurting, and the core reason why economies are collapsing isn't because of a sniffle, 
um, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, the CV has affected a lot of um, people and, and of course taken lives. Um, but if you actually look at the statistics, the numbers, the flu has affected a lot of people and taken a lot of lives, a, sig a significantly greater number of lives. But of course, now that we see this new strand of a flu virus that is um, quite serious and taking lives and spreading quickly and in many ways unknown to us because we haven't seen this strand before, uh, it, it is something that we should be taking quite seriously. Uh, however, history does... Um, tell us a lot and as I spoke about in my last video we should be looking at what history has shown us in the past if history does not repeat itself it most certainly rhymes okay my crypto goers uh, brothers sisters investors uh, watchers viewers around the world uh, I've really got to go because I have a huge day tomorrow and it is already nearly midnight here thanks for listening leave your comments below uh, any questions send them through I really want to know from you are you guys cancelling your travel plans and have you noticed that fuel is getting cheaper or anything else that may have been getting imported is getting more expensive? I want to know on the ground stuff. Are you finding that there's anything out there that you can't get from the shops anymore? And are you seeing anything else that may be getting cheaper or more expensive? Let's have a discussion. Put your comments below. Let us know. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. Stay safe. Wash your hands. And I'll talk to you next time.